today is Blessed Assurance. And the title of it is The Triumph of Faith. Triumph of Faith over sight. If everyone ever had cause to be discouraged and depressed, it was Fanny Crosby. As an infant, she was accidentally blinded by a country doctor's application of a mustard poultice on her eyes. Her father passed away while she was still a small child. She married at, age of eight, married at the age of 38, and her only child died in infancy. After 25 years of marriage, she was widowed and lived the remainder of her life 32 additional years alone. Yet this tiny and energetic woman never became bitter or morose. Her spirit was one of joy and enthusiasm. A little poem she wrote at the age of eight seemed to be the theme of her long and fruitful life. Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep inside because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Fanny Crosby's resolution to enjoy life and to be appreciative of her many blessings was translated into a full and active life, one that contributed to the religious heritage of the United States in a remarkable and lasting way. As is immediate obvious, obvious, immediately obvious from the lovely point above, Fanny possessed the gift of rhyming at an early age. Acute memory and great gifts of insight and deep concentration. At the age of 15, she was sent to the New York Institute for the Blind, where she learned to read Braille and eventually to teach. After completing her education at the institution, she served as a member of its faculty for 11 years. During the latter years of her teaching assignment, she met and married Alexander Van Alstein, a blind musician. After leaving the teaching profession, Fanny moved most of the time to writing popular songs that were set to music by G.F. Root. In 1864, Fanny was introduced to William Bradbury, a pioneer in writing music for American Sunday School. Bradbury was impressed by Fanny's poetic gifts, and he challenged her to turn her talents to writing Christian songs and hymns. From that time forward, it is reported that she never wrote another secular song, concentrating all her talents and energies on composing verses for gospel singing. She wrote under her own name as well as under 200 pseudonyms. Her lifetime production of him has been estimated to be over 8,000. It is said that she prayed fervently prior to setting pen to paper and that many of her hymns seemed to flow from her mind as fluid as of a conversation. Such it was with the composition of Blessed Assurance. One afternoon in 1873, Fanny was visited with her good friend Mrs. Joseph Knapp, the, found, uh, the wife of the founder of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Mrs. Knapp was an amateur musician who enjoyed composing melodies. On this occasion, she had a new one she wanted to play for her friend. She played the tune through once and asked Fanny, what does this tune say? Fanny knelt there and in Knapp's parlor and Mrs. Knapp played the melody over again. Suddenly, Fanny smiled and rose to her feet, announcing it says, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Fanny continued to dictate the verses and Ms. Knapp wrote them down. Joined them to her melody as we have them today. This was just one of the thousands of hymns Fanny Crosby wrote in her full and moving life. Others that might be familiar are Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Praise Him, praise Him. Draw me nearer, near the cross. Take the world would give me Jesus, to be God the glory. Rescue the perishing. He hideth my soul and pass me not, O gentle Savior. When Fanny Crosby died six weeks before her 95th birthday, she left the world a rich legacy of gospel songs. Throughout the past century, millions of Christians all over the world have been inspired and have been encouraged by her words. Yet on her tombstone, at Bridgeport, Connecticut, there's a simple inscription that sums up the attitude of humility. It is a portion of scripture taken from the remarks of Jesus when he was questioned about the woman at Bethany who had anointed his head with costly perfume. It read, she had done what she could. And that's the story of Fanny Crawford. And we're going to sing Blessed Assurance. Yes. All three
three verses. Number 64. And those who are able, please stand. <laughs>
birthday. Oh, there ain't no birthday. Year nine, there ain't no, no birthday. <laughs> Astonishingly, it took Handel only 24 days to write the orchestral music for the Messiah Oratorio, today perhaps the world's most famous musical composition, one, one performed thousands of times every year around the world. The magnificent work reaches its climax nearly two hours after it begins with the most famous part of the oratorio, the Hallelujah Chorus. As I read this first sentence, a flood of memories came back to me. Sixty some odd years ago, my uncle sent me to France, where I lived for three and a, two and a half years in the army. <laughs> I was stationed in Orléans, which is a city of about a hundred thousand. And someone came up with an idea that we should have a community chorus and do Handel's Messiah for Christmas. And the word went out and surprisingly, several of us soldiers signed up and a large number of the local population signed up. After starting practice probably in August or September, it became very apparent that the words of the Messiah touched all of us. Some of us learned more French, some of us learned more English, but we were together and we sang this in a beautiful cathedral in Orléans. Mm -hmm. The acoustics were astonishing. I could sit on the back row of the choir and hear someone talk from the back row of the sanctuary and vice versa. And as we got the program all together, we had soloists from the Paris Opera Company. The musicians, other than the organ, were from the Paris Philharmonic Orchestra. And if you don't think, this didn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Amen. I don't know what to do. But even before that, the Messiah was one of my very favorite songs. And I've been fortunate enough to sing it two or three times. And if you have a chance, sometime before Christmas, the Jacksonville Symphony, Symphony Orchestra and Chorus presents the Messiah. And when it comes to the Hallelujah Chorus, I guarantee you, Everybody is singing, and it is a blessing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of music that you give us. Let us enjoy it and live it. Amen. Conversation with Andrew was just simple. If you look at the, you remember the music that was out there. My staff went like this. Yeah. I know it's kind of hard to follow. Oh, <laughs> now this morning we get an opportunity to talk about to continue our talk about the beginning of the nation of God. Remember we started with Abraham and Isaac, and last week we found out about a man named Jacob. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as 
Pastor <coughs> Kelly proceeded. He told us about another man named Joseph, Jacob's son. And I think that as I look at, looked at the lesson for today, I realized that, like I have said many times about this, this, all of this is a book report. And I hope that everybody who reads any portion of this has gone, for instance, to the first verses of chapter 32. We don't get into it until much later. And in order to understand what was going on, you had to go back to chapter 28, because that's the beginning of Jacob's journey. And Jacob's journey is what this is all about, his journey with God. He starts off as a deceiver, yet he grew up as a young man whose mother had heard about from God that the youngest one was going to rule, is one of twi set of twins. So he knew that he had God's blessing from the very beginning, but he and his mother decided very early on that God couldn't handle all the details. Remember how that happened with Abraham and Sarah? And Sarah decided that she just wasn't going to handle all of this and have a child at 90 years old. So she couldn't believe it was possible. So she went and she thought that she found an alternate way. Well, this is what happens with Jacob's mother. She looks at, she knows that God has said this, but she also knows she's got a husband who favors the older brother. And she, there's a tension between the two of them. So I think that today, when I, in order to understand the bottom line of this lesson, and the bottom line of this lesson is a segue to next week. Right? Because what we're talking about is the building of a nation for God. He has decided at a point that it's time that he has to have his own nation to bless all the other nations by calling them to him. Okay? So that's one of the lessons of the, of the uh, points of this lesson. The other point is that in that family, this first family, there is a a portion of the messianic line. It started with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it's got to go through. Now he's got 12 sons. Now with Dale mentioned progenitor, the, everything goes to the firstborn. Well, surprise, surprise. It didn't happen with, I, with Jacob and Esau, and we're gonna find it's not gonna happen here. And <coughs> lo and behold, you might find it a few other times because there's gonna be another set of twins shortly in our Line, messianic line. <clears throat> I don't know if we'll even study that. I think we should somewhere in here. But this book, it used to be about twice as thick as it is because each lesson used to have 10 pages. Guess what? They're down to five. Okay? So things have changed a lot in the last 70 years. Anyway, so what I've done here is just make a chart of, Dave, of Jacob's and I will talk about that in a minute. First, I better read the scripture of, of that for today. And then go back to chapter 28, which is where, again, this really all started, the relationship of Jacob with God. The first, the uh, background scripture and the today's scriptures, chapter 32, and it goes from verses 22 to 32. And it's starting with the end of the actual story. And it says, That night Jacob got up with his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the street, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. Now, this is the end of his story where he'd been sent up to get a wife, got two of them, <coughs> sent up to where his uh, father had gotten his wife, from way down in Beersheba, by the way, if there was a map here before south, <laughs> and we would go up to, down to Beersheba, he'd go back up to Haran, and Haran is way up in Syria, okay? But he goes up there, this 20 years, and now he's on his way back down, and now he's crossing a spot 
near Bethel, which is where he stopped on the way up. He stopped in at a vision from God, which is where our story really should start. We should go back to chapter 28. We'll talk about that. Because in that point, he had only a staff. That's all he had. He was running from his brother. He was a fugitive. He had a staff when he crossed it. Now he's crossing the same body of water, a little bit different ford at Jabbok instead of Bethel. But anyway, now he's got possessions. He actually had a lot of possessions. And he had sent them all over across to the brook. And here he is alone, scared to death. Why would he be scared to death? Who did he leave in down in uh, Beersheba? His brother. Esau. And Esau and he weren't very happy, were they? He, mm -hmm. he had just robbed Esau of his birthright <laughs> and the blessing. Those are two different, two different separate things. Distinct things and both important things. But he'd stolen those from him and now he's going back and he is going to pray. But before he gets into his prayer, he meets a man, and the man wrestles with him. Deal with what happened last week, and I'm not going to, that's one reason I divert a little bit from this lesson. I'm not going to repeat all what Dale said. But he wrestled with the man. The man doing this wrestling match, it comes to a draw, and it gets to daybreak, and all of a sudden, it wasn't really a draw, but the man sort of held back on him. But he says, he wouldn't let me go, and I won't let you go until you give me a blessing. And they ask each other's names. Uh, he asked Jacob what his name is. And the reason he would ask him that, he wants Jacob to admit to himself what he is. His name means supplanter. And in, in the womb, he was already supplanting. He was grabbing at the heel of the rightful heir. And he then worked his way up and came up, or down in this case, and became the first in the line of succession. So his brother's very, very unhappy with him. And Dada, Jacob is forgetting the first visit that he had with God, where on his way up he stopped at Bethel. This is chapter 28. We'll go back to the beginning of that. And here we have a situation where he's alone again. He laid his head down and has a dream. He laid his head down on a rock. That's what he's using for a pillow. So he's in pretty sad shape, this guy. What happens to him next is he sees a vision. And he sees heaven opening up, opening up. There's a ladder, starts down at earth, reaches up to heaven, and there are angels going up and down it. And God himself comes down and talks to him. And he blesses him, and he tells him he's going to be with him, whatever ha happens, and to be with him. That's a great encounter to have with God, is it not? Jacob goes off, and he lives 20 years. And during his 20 years, he's producing this family. And this is the family he's bringing back. And I like to. I like this area, which we're going to study in more depth in our uh, Thursday morning session, where we're going to the beginning of the Bible. We got through two chapters on last Thursday, and we'll hit another one or two or three. But this is an important part of our Christian life, our Judeo-Christian history, and it starts off with something less than a functional family, if you will. Right? So, to finish the portion of the wrestling, it says that when a man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and his hip was wrenched out while he was wrestling. We'll read the rest, the rest as we go along instead of the little pieces. Jesus, uh, God, the angel of God, was when he's wrestling, he says, let me go, and of course he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. What's your name? Your name will no longer be Jacob, but your name is going to be Israel because you have struggled with God and with man, with humans, and have overcome. And then Jacob, feeling pretty spicy, said, please tell me your name. And remember who he's talking to. And he no, you shouldn't ask my name. And he said, why do you ask my name? He understands that he shouldn't have done it, and he has been blessed. The third portion of our text is, so Jacob called the place Peniel, 
saying, because I saw God face to face and I lived to tell about him. The sun above him as he passed Benil, and he was limping because of his hip. And today he tells you about the tradition that the Israelites will not eat that, that portion, that tendon of an animal because in remembrance of this here. So now he's scared to death. And he prays a prayer, which I, I learned something that, again, as you do this all the time, something different. He prays a prayer that is, my commentary Bible says, is the very first prayer recorded in Scripture. Okay? And just before that, he made a vow, which is supposed to be the very first vow that ever made in Scripture. And the vow that he made was, God, if you're going to help me out of this with these, uh, I'm going to be yours, and I'm going to give you one piece of everything I can. Yeah. Okay? That's where it started. Not some of the other places. That's where it started. And the key to that is if you make a vow, you better keep it. Right? Well, anyway, he made that vow, and the, the story is that one of the main points of this story is that he's asked God for help told him what he would do if he got the help, and what's the next thing he did? You know that? He started planning. He told his servants, we're going to meet my, my brother Esau, and he sent a messenger out. The messengers came back and said, oh, he got your message, and he's going to meet you, and he's got 400 men with him. Hmm. <laughs> what does Jacob have? He has four wives, well, two wives and two men, Service, depending on how you look at that, and he's got 11 children. I don't know if Dinah was born by that time, maybe he was 12, 13. But Benjamin was not born at that time, we know that for sure. But anyway, that what's he got? But he's got God. And I, what he should have done, perhaps, is remembered something, the beginning, chapter 32, the very first lines. So Jacob went on his way. Now he's already sent his family in front of him. He's got the flocks are all split up so that Esau gets to see a long parade. He said, he told the servants, keep a space between the droves so that uh, it looks like it's more than it is. Does that sound like Jacob? Yeah. <laughs> when you're heavy, you're, uh, stand on your human heels if you <laughs> make it look really good. So anyway, he has this, there in my head of him, and he goes on. But chapter 32 starts out, so Jacob went on his way, and the angels of the Lord went with him. The angels of God, actually, my text says the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he saw the angels, now, how do we, how does a normal man see angels? Only if God wants them. But when Jacob saw him, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Menahamon. Why? Because when he, he explained that that means he had two. He, came, he had two camps. He went up with the staff, and he came back with two camps. One was his own meager camp of this, but he also had the host of God. Even though he himself had asked God for help, knew that he was going to get help, and then he went and told God how to do it, and he then himself decided he was going to send a gift to sort as insurance. He was going to bribe his brother, make his brother feel good that way, but he was going to do what he's asking God to do, put him in his brother's good graces. Deceiver, now remember by the way also, if you think about Jacob, he was a deceiver when he went up, he's a deceiver when he comes back, but he met a big deceiver when he was up there, right? Remember he wanted to marry the youngest daughter, Rachel, and Laban fooled him into marrying Leah. And then he gave, it when there was a confrontation afterwards, and that's when Jacob found out about it, so he said, well, give her her week, and then I will give you the other one. So now after seven years of working, he has one wife for a week, and then he has two wives. 
when he got the two wives, each one of them got a maid, a maid servant. So, Zilpah and Bilhah. And then starts the competition. He starts with Leah, and he has four children, four sons. Pretty, she's happy, right? She's the unhappy wife because she knows she's number two. Even though she was first, she's number two. But she now has four aces in the hole because Rachel has got nothing. So Rachel comes along and she says, I'm going to give you Jacob. I'm going to give you Bilhah. And she will bear children that I can raise on my knee. And that was not uncommon because that's what happened with Sarah and Agar. She wanted a child that she could raise on her knee. The same thing happens here. And Bilhah gives Dan and Naphtali. So now she has two, she has four. Leah says, she can play at that game. So she says, because she has stopped bearing. So she gives her Zilpa to Jacob. And he comes in. Gad and Asher are born. So now she has her four plus two more on her knee against Rachel's two. Okay. The game. So you understand first place that this when we talk about a my my family consists of this kind of simple family. We've got mother, father, two kids. And that was at the time when they were said we were we supposed to reproduce ourselves. Do you remember that? You no, know, in China, if you don't feel like China, we'll have all these old kids. They, they gave us a lot of propaganda that wasn't good for us. But we followed it anyway. So <coughs> all my, everybody but my brother, he got involved before he read, was old enough to read that stuff, I guess. Rather than, but everybody else, too. All my in-laws, too, too, too. Well, he's got 12. But he doesn't really have one big family of 12. He's got Two families split by the sisters, right? Each one is a family. Do you agree with that? And these people over here, what, why I stress this is, we talk about Joseph. Uh, Dale talked about God picking Joseph, the lowest, way down here. Well, he was in the birth order, he was the lowest, and he was not going to be the, this line was not going to be the messianic line, right? What was Joseph's job? Joseph's job turned out to be to save the whole family during the famine. So he was in, had an important play part to role, important role to play, but he was not in the Messianic line. These guys here, as it turns out, had, there were six brothers. They're the only brothers in the whole bunch. Had the same wife. Correction. We actually have three instances like this. They were the largest group. Mother, father were the same for these six people and for Dinah at the end. Over here, father and mother were the same for these two. Father and mother were the same for these two. The same in right here. So you really had four individual families that actually had brothers. Three of those four only had one brother each. These people had five brothers. That make any sense to you? Can you see how that would, the dynamics of that family would be something that you can't go home from work has <laughs> got a lot more problems than I had. Anyway, a lot of things happened with those. Those particular things. I'm going to leave some of that alone because your next lesson is going to be on where the messianic line came from. <coughs> and you'll get, so it, it's really fascinating how God chooses and how he gets rid of some people every now and then that can go up, to get them out of the way, even though they are in the progenitor line, progenitor line. The point I guess I wanted to make was, in this instance, one, two very big points. One, when you ask God for his help and he gives it to you, you don't have to go out and try and do it yourself. And I'm, I'm just learning that. I'm just learning that. I've been, many times I prepare a lesson and I spend a great deal of time on it. If 
by the time I get up here, he says, now, why don't you do it my way? And if I'm lucky, I do. And if I don't, I have no problems. And that's with many parts of my life. And I hope, I imagine you, some of you have that, have had that. It, it, it's funny, that I, a long time ago, I tried to write a, a poem which described how you get along with God. And praying is, I ask, I ask God for his will. Then I pray, oh Lord, that he agrees with me. And that was the first couple of the four lines. The next ones were, it's not working so well. Change me so that I can see your will. And finally, you come to the point where you want to do his will. But in between, since then, I still have many times tried to suggest heavily to God how it should be done or what needs to be done. Instead of laying down, this is my problem, this is my fear, this is it. Please, I cannot handle it. And there's so many things I'm not able to handle. It doesn't stop me from trying, but I know better. I still do it anyway. Do you? Do you get, what's God's reaction when that happens to you? Do you ever notice that he, he lets you know? Well, he let Jacob know. And by the time Jacob is putting up his feet down in uh, Egypt and putting his, his now name is Israel, Israel, of course, and he's bring after he's just told his family, he told every one of his sons what was going to happen to them, what he put his blessing. And it wasn't necessarily a nice blessing for some of them, but he had reasons for everything he did. That's an interesting story. We get to that, God willing, we'll get to that on our Thursday mornings, but we only have six weeks, so heaven only knows how far that would get. But the points are kind of simple. God is God. He wants to bless every one of us. He wants every one of us to be blessed, of course. He wants us to, wants only one thing from us. We can use different words like word, like respect, honor, love. But when you come down to one word, Jesus said you would call me my friends. You say that I'm your friend. Why don't you hear do what I say? Okay? He wants us to obey him. Amen. That was the hardest lesson that Jacob had to learn. It's the hardest lesson that Bob Rivers will ever learn, I hope. He gets to it completely one of these days. And I hope that every one of you gets to know. He has the authority to have whatever he wants, to be whoever he wants to be, to do. And he tells us, this book is so full of just him telling me what he wants to do. So I, I hope that I continue these as book reports. Chapter 28 of Genesis, chapter 32 of Genesis, I think you'll love it. You'll get an insight to where we're really going. And part of that insight, by the way, I was helped, and I think there's no one in Patty could agree, people who were in our Revelations class could come back to the beginning and understand the beginning better than we read it the first time. The beginning of Genesis. In other words, we learned about Genesis from Revelation. The book closes, the lesson for today closes with a prayer that, that's a long book, I guess. The, there was a while, a while when they, we were using a, an international lesson that didn't use the teacher's guide. The teacher's guide, in this case, actually has some very good stuff in it. So, and if I can find it, we'll read that prayer. Here we go. O God of Jacob, you are present in our struggle. We ask that you use these moments to reveal yourself to us in a unique way. We want to better understand your will and your direction and to follow it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And since we've gone to, back to David C. <coughs> Cook, he also gives us some lines to remember, thoughts to remember. Despite the darkness, despite our struggles, God is present. God is there. All we have to do is recognize that. Thank you very much. Bill, are you all ready?
Yeah. I'm looking forward. I don't know. I, I've not yet met the uh, next week's teacher. Or was it you? Is it? Oh, okay. Bill, will we introduce? Is it Josh? Am I right? Yeah. Josh back, and he's going to teach. And this is just, hopefully we'll join our class. We are the young married class, so you're in good. <laughs> <laughs> all the advice I can get on that front. <laughs> Felt bad for Jacob, two wives. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Asbury class, good morning. Our leader is not here, so I'm sitting here in her place. Is there any announcements? Are there any announcements or business that needs to be brought before us? We have a nice thank you note from Betty Taylor, who of course is leaving us and moving to Tallahassee. And not too long ago, we had a meeting together and had supper as a going away party, and many of us attended. The dear Asbury class, words cannot express my joy in getting to spend some precious time with all of you Thursday evening. Thank you all for making it possible and giving me memories of the church along with very special Coastbury hymnal. We gave one of the old Coastbury hymnals and we all signed it. Please stay in touch and keep a seat for me when I can visit. You have all been such a very special part of my life. Loving Christ, Betty Taylor. If there are no announcements or business, I'll tell you what going to happen. It's a joke. Four old guys are walking down the street. They turn a corner and see this sign, Old Timers Bar, all drinks 10 cents. They look at each other and go in thinking, this is too good to be true. The old bartender says in a voice that carries across the room, come on in and let me pour one for you. What will it be, gentlemen? There's a fully stocked bar, so each of the men orders a martini. In no time, the bartender serves up four ice martinis, shaken, not stirred, and says, that's 10 cents, please. The four guys stare at the bartender for a moment, then each other. They can't believe their good luck. They pay the 40 cents, finish their martinis, and order another round. Again, four excellent martinis are produced, with the bartender again saying, that's 40 cents, please. They pay the 40 cents, but their curiosity gets the better of them. They've each had two martinis and haven't even spent a dollar yet. Finally, one of them says, how can you afford to serve martinis as good as these for a dime apiece? He said, I'm a retired tailor from Phoenix, and I always wanted to own a bar. Last year, I hit the lottery jackpot for 125 million and decided to open this place. Every drink costs a dime, wine, liquor, beer, it's all the same. Wow, that's some story, one of the men says, as the four of them sip their martinis. They can't help but noticing seven other people at the end of the bar. And they have no drinks in front of them and haven't ordered anything the whole time they've been there. Now they get the seven at the end of the bar, one of the men asks the bartender, what's with them? The bartender says, they're retired people from Florida. They're waiting for the happy hour when drinks are only half price. <laughs> 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 